Good evening. How are we all doing? <laughs> Thanks, Darius. Yep. Spot on. Excellent. Let's see who's lurking. Seeing a few faces already. So, good evening to bug number 13, Jace. I am sorry I can't pronounce that D-W-Q-N-D. That is a good name, but a hard one to say. Infinisil, Metayam, Popolix. Uh, our Primus Chimera for as long as you're around. And o Oglastraxi, V and K, and Virgo Pros, and the bot. Good evening. How you all doing? Audio and video is perfect. Pump, pump, you're here too. Did I just greet you? I didn't see you in the... It seems that Twitch is not showing me all the people. So greetings to the other people I didn't actually see there. Um, we're back. We're back. I've got a new PC for streaming. So this is actually recording this time, which is good. We're back in business. Um... Another Intel Nook, we're all good. Um, I've just seen that Jace is talking about a... About, sorry, Jace has been asked about a stream they're doing this weekend um, on multi-threading in Common Lisp. Please give us details, because I'd love to know about that. Apparently it is on Sunday around noon EST. Um, that would be really cool. I need to set an alarm for that, actually. What am I doing this weekend? Probably that. Let's see. So. Dun-dun-dun-dun-dun. Where are we? Alarm! So around... Oh, screw it. I'll have to do this after the stream. Which is probably means I'm going to forget. But anyway, let's not try and waste this time that we do have. Because we have a couple of hours. And we are going to start digging into... SSAO, which is Screen Space Ambient Occlusion. We're going to find out what it is. We're going to find out how, according to this article, to implement it. And we are going to give it a go. We are giving ourselves a few weeks to do this because don't want to rush it and try and cram this into two hours because our normal pattern, and I'm sure we'll repeat this again, is we speed through the thing, the article, we start implementing, everything feels great, then we run it, and of course, everything's wrong. And uh, then I proceed to make it worse for about half an hour until it's 20 minutes before the end, and then there's frantic typing and swearing, and then it's the end of the stream. And I go, oh. So this time we're not going to do that. We're going to try and take things slow. Um, please remind me that's... Um, Pond of saying, is the Nook on point? It is. Uh, I've basically got the equivalent, the modern equivalent of the same model. So it's a later revision. It's an i5. Doodad. What do they call it? duck has got a stupid name. Where is it? Here we go. Yes, the Intel i5 core. Baby Canyon, which is just... I think at this point they need to give up on naming things in general and just stick to... A series of numbers um but yeah it's a good piece of shit so i'm back in business it's at least cheap enough that it isn't completely destroying my my month unboxing <laughs> video you can go watch that on another channel because i will not be doing that um so yeah we're digging in is there anything else i can't remember i don't think i've got any progress on the compiler this last week um i am having some more thoughts on API changes to Keppel, which we will probably talk about another time, because we should really just get into this, otherwise I have a tendency to ramble for half an hour till we get started. So. But please, I'd love to hear how your week's going and stuff like that. Chat in chat, as you do, and uh, yeah, yell things at me. We'll get going. So, let's get this up to a, reason, a readable size. How is that? Um... Okay, so that should be, uh, this should do. Ah, oh, links on point, thank you so much, you people rock. Medianne, good to have you here. Okay, um, so let's go through. We briefly touched on, like, so this is referring to an earlier lighting tutorial that they have, uh, probably in the basic lighting section here. Um, they are talking about... Ambient light. Ambient lighting is a fixed light constant we add to the overall scene to simulate the scattering of light. In reality, light scatters in all kinds of directions with varying intensities, so the indirect part, um, so, the, so, the, so the indirectly lit parts of the scene should always have varying intensities instead of, a, yeah, instead of this constant factor we've been using. So if we go over to our, our little thing over here, our old friend, do you remember when we used to do graphics? I do. Um, so we have some lighting here. We have this scene. Let's go to the rendering code. It's been a long time. But there is this fragment stage here, which is currently being used um, to calculate all the lighting. So we're passing in a bunch of things like normals and positions and UVs and tangent base, like um, tangent base normals or something like that. <laughs> I can't remember what that matrix is. Um, 
but yes. And, and then we're doing some computation and like just getting our normals into tangent space, I guess. Then we um, go through and assuming we have lights, um, we increment the diffuse power by whatever we value we calculate for the lights. If we jump over here, we can see there is a function that we use for calculating the, the uh, light amount. The light, um, what is it? The amount of light delivered from that source. And we increment that. So what we could do is we could take this and uh, rather than recompiling it, we'll comment it out, recompile, and everything goes away. And then we'll go and find this ambient factor here. So it's pulling it from some top level variable, ambient, which is currently set to zero. So if we set this to be something higher, like 0 0.1, um, then we can start to see things coming in. Let's just whack it up to a, a level that we can we can see. Notice how everything is very flat, because what we're getting is the same amount of light on everything. I think this area really shows, like there's so little definition of what's going on here, because there's no, um, yeah, there's nothing to, those shadows to really break it up. Um, let's just do that again and show what it was like before. Fuck you, buddy. Oh, I've added a zero up here. Clumsy typing. Oh, it wasn't actually... <laughs> I picked the one place that wasn't really clear to begin with. Come on, let's find something with a bit of definition. Um, let's see what this was like. Um, let's whack the ambient up and let's comment this out. Um, so yes, there's not a great deal of definition between uh, the different faces in here. Everything's getting equal light amount. Uh, but when we shove this in and turn the ambience down, we can see nice stark differences here due to, yeah. The difference between the angle that the light is coming in at and the angle of the surface, the normal of the surface even. Um, so we have this constant factor that we use to, to simulate just general light bouncing around. But it's not really that great because we say it's, it's equal everywhere and that's not how real life is. Especially down here, we've got all these little nooks. It should be getting less down in these corners because um, more of it's just going to be kind of bouncing away. So we want to simulate that and this is apparently called ambient occlusion. Let's follow this uh, tutorial and see what we get to. Um, one type of indirect lighting approximation is called ambient occlusion that tries to approximate indirect lighting by darkening creases, holes, and surfaces that are close to each other. These areas are largely occluded by surrounding geometry, like here, or maybe some of these nooks down here, things near the edges here. Um, they're largely occluded by surrounding geometry and have thus less light rays have, I'm sorry, thus light rays have less places to escape Hence the areas appearing darker. So yes, light rays bounce around and slowly get absorbed. And they cannot escape. Take a look at the corners and creases of your room to see that light uh, seems just a little darker. So below is an example of a scene with and without SAO. So what they're trying to show here is this bit. We've got a little bit of shading around here. And this one you do not. And there is apparently, again, with a bunch of the tutorials here, it doesn't feel like it gives the best example actually i think it might be showing up better on the stream than it even does on my screen but yeah you can see a bit more definition here than we get on this side um but it can actually be a very again it's a pretty powerful effect while not incredibly obvious effect the image the image with um ssao enable does feel a lot more realistic due to these small occlusion like details giving this entire scene a greater feeling of depth so that's cool. Um, so that's what I want to do. Originally, I was thinking, oh, this lion would be perfect. But as you can see, there's all kinds of fake shadows that have been put into this, which is fine, but it doesn't make it a great candidate for um, us to see this effect in action. So I think things like joins here, like where things meet the floor and all that kind of stuff is going to be a better place. And these fonts in general down here. Um, these are going to be much better places to see the effect. You can see darkening in here, which again, which is coming from the textures. We could remove the textures and put like a flat. Yeah, actually, let's do that. Let's see what happens. If we take um, albedo, what happens if we do 
this. So we just go 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. Okay, so everything is just grey now. If we put our lights back on and turn ambient down, we can see, look at this, look at this lovely object here. And you can see it because we've done all this work with normal maps and things like in creating shadows. Um, but when we just had the ambient light, you could see nothing. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and use this other technique to start adding more of this detail in as well. In cases, in places where we don't really handle it, like in the boundaries between things. So let's bring that out and set ambient occlusion. Sorry, set ambient light up. And you can see gloriously everything looks the same because everything has the same um, has the same albedo and is receiving the same light amount because there is no diffuse power but there is only ambient light and so our final color is just this times this so yeah we're going to see how this helps us over time for now just so it's not just a gray thing over there i am going to put the original albedo back in along with its fake shadows and nooks and crannies and we will carry on with the reading but i need coffee um by the way, how is the game jam? Ah, yes. Um, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to make an entry in time. Because I just have a lot of stuff going on right now. Are you seeing a flicker on my um, on my little camera here, by the way? Um, I'm getting a bit of a rolling kind of thing. And I believe it's due to my lamp up there is using an LED bulb. And they tend to strobe. Um, to save power. So if that if you're seeing that, let me know and I will remove that because it's kind of annoying. Um, bug number 13 saying, a question regarding class. What happens if a slot definition overlaps with it? the name of a slot in the superclass? Um, then you will be redefining that in some way. I'm not sure of the exact rules there, but you can, you're like, yeah. A bit of flicker on the white wall but not too disturbing awesome okay um let's have a look at def class quickly see what the official documentation says and let's look at anything that says super class um The new class will inherit slots and methods from each of its direct superclasses, from their direct superclasses, and so on. For a discussion of how slots and methods are inherited, look at inheritance. Um, let's keep on going through here. In fact, inheritance is probably where we need to be looking. Um, class can inherit method slots. Da, 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 da. From the superclass, other sections describe the inheritance methods, and the inheritance of slots and slot options, and the inheritance of class options. Um, okay, so here we can see C1, which is defined S1 and S2, and C2, which inherits from C1, and um, defines S1 and S2. And S1, it's redefining the init form, and it's keeping the same type. And this one is changing the kind of allocation. Let's look at S1, because that's the simpler example for right now. Instances of the class C1 have a local slot named S1, whose default initial value is 5.4, and whose value should always be a number. Um, there is a local slot named S1 in instances of C2. The default initial value of S1 is 5, Yes, yeah, so this is just really telling us what it says and not the rules. Um, that's class options, which I'm not so interested in. Other sections describe, so I'm not really... So precedence. Whole precedence thing, solving the diamond problem and all that kind of jazz. Redefining classes. No, it's not really going to be here. Okay, I'm going to leave that one as exercise for another time, uh, because otherwise I will get sucked into that. 
but it is very interesting. So cheers for the question. Um, did I just pass the rules for the slot options? You're joking me. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. We were so close. Was it in death class? Or was it in the inheritance section? Oh, that's so funny. Um... Ah, it said that the slots end up consolidated, not duplicated. Console. Where? Where did you see this? Four dot three dot four dot one. Okay, let's have a look. Four dot three dot four dot one. Oh, it literally. Oh, sorry. I thought you were saying it literally has the definition there because I'm, I'm really interested in is that bit where it says like the rules, which Jace was mentioning that we skipped straight over, and I would love to know where that was because we can just go and read them quickly. Um, there's some flickering on the wall little flickering nothing that prevents us following along okay well we'll leave it for now and if anger builds then we'll deal with it um, <laughs> Jason thinks he's gone mad if you do find it that would be really cool uh, for now I will dive back here and we will get on so, okay so um, ambient occlusion techniques are expensive as they have to take into account surrounding uh, geometry. One could shoot a large number of rays from each point in space to determine the amount of occlusion. It's, it's a, right, really, we need to say, okay, for this point, how much occlusion is there around here? And we can't change, like, there are infinite angles that we could be checking, so we're going to sample a certain number of directions, and that will tell us how much occlusion we've got. You might want to cast a ray and see how far to hit something. But doing that for every position in the world is obviously impossible um, in, in anything, anything approaching real time. Um, and so, yes, that is not going to happen. So we need to find something faster than that. And of course, back in 2007, Crytek uh, came up with a technique called Screen Space Ambient Occlusion. And what it does, it uses the scene's depth um, information in screen space to determine the amount of occlusion instead of real geometric data. So what we're going to do, it's a kind of post-processing effect. We're going to store a load of data in, our, in buffers, and then in another pass, we're going to go through and we're going to do some computation to try and, yeah, reason about how much um, occlusion there is based on the information we have. And if that sounds familiar, um, this whole like writing a bunch of information into the buffers and then doing a second pass it sounds very much like our deferred rendering and we're going to see that we can reuse a lot of that stuff so what we're going to end up having to do is take this stuff we've done here and we're going to move it over to a deferred rendering approach and uh, we're going to do this stuff on top of it so it's going to be quite a bit of work for ourselves but it's stuff we've done before but it's been a while so it'd be good to to go through all that again Okay, so ambient occlusion techniques. Oh yeah, we just said they're expensive. Cool, and Crytek did a thing. And what they did, okay. So the basics behind screen space ambient occlusion are simple. For each fragment on a screen filled quad, we calculate an occlusion factor. So for each fragment, um, based on the fragments surrounding depth values. The occlusion factor is then used to reduce or nullify the fragment's ambient lighting component. So yeah, we're gonna look around at depths and then we're gonna try and find out like, ah, this this feels occluded to us. Okay, we'll reduce the quantity of light that's being provided. Okay, so the occlusion factor is obtained by taking multiple depth samples in a sphere sample kernel surrounding the fragment position and compare each of the samples with the current fragment's depth value. The number of samples that are higher depth value than the fragment's depth represent the occlusion factor. So let's try and break that down. Um, by the way, so do we have our 
doodling device um, available. Let's see if it's going to play with me today. Pen, 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 pen. pen. Yes. Okay, good. Fine. So we have that on standby. Excellent. So what are we saying? Could have sworn I saw it. Sorry for the little field trip. Not a problem at all. Um, <laughs> we're lispers. We are insane. We've certainly made bad life choices. Um, cool. Yes, I'm not sure about that enlightenment, mate. <laughs> If it's so light in here, why do I keep bumping into everything? Um, so let's have a C. Okay, so based on the fragments surrounding depth values, that makes sense to me. Like we have a like, we can store depth information for this for this scene. I'll gesture with a mouse, and uh, then for a given point, we can compare the depth surrounding it. That makes a lot of sense. And then if you had, if they're all the same depth then you've got kind of a flat surface in kind of your screen space um if they change in a again like if, i suppose if they if they change in a linear way across an area but if they're very divergent then you've probably got some kind of spiky geometry or something like this there's like changes in depth rapidly um then yeah like those you're probably going to be in some um some little nook or cranny so it's like it'd be the difference between a surface like this, a uh, surface like this. If we're looking down in this direction, these depths here are going to have, they're going to have very different depths with a very small space. Whereas here, the depth is changing very gradually. So I'm not sure how much that's taken into account, but that's what we're going to find out. Mouse. Go away. Right, so the occlusion factor is used to reduce or nullify, null, nullify the fragment's ambient component. That's fine. The occlusion factor is obtained by taking multiple depth samples in a sphere sample kernel surrounding the fragment position. That's interesting. So, it's interesting that it's a sphere. Because I mean, yeah, fundamentally, like we still have, because we have um, depth information, we have a 3D scene to a degree. Like everything is extruded backwards, as it were. But but yes, then you're taking a sphere around that point. I'm interested in how that's going to be different from, yeah, taking like a circular sample around the point. I suppose it's going to take into account the normal? No, not if it's a sphere. That's interesting. Yeah, we're going to have to see what that means. That's okay. Uh, so that's one area I don't understand so far. And then compare each of the samples with the current fragment's depth value. That's good. The number of samples that have higher depth than the fragment's depth represent the occlusion factor. Yeah, so if we sample a bunch of things around the fragment and a bunch of them are further away, yeah, then that's interesting that that's the occlusion one, not actually closer. Yeah, that's probably fine. We're going to see how this affects things anyway. Each of the gray depth samples that are inside geometry contribute to the total occlusion factor. The more samples we find inside geometry, the less ambient lighting. So yeah, I mean, like, if you take a sphere, oh, I suppose then a number of samples, like, if, if, you, if you were to take a sphere, then you're going to get multiple samples that are actually going to be on the same fragment, I guess. And then... Yes, those sample points are going to be further away than the depth that we're, from the, we're sampling from the depth buffer, assuming that we're just using the depth buffer. Um, so that could make sense. It's clear that the quality and precision of the effect directly relates to the number of surrounding samples we take. If the sample count is too low, the precision drastically reduces, and we get an artifact called banding. If 
If it's too high, we lose performance. Okay, yeah, we can reduce the number of samples we have to test by introducing some randomness into the sample kernel by randomly rotating the sample kernel each fragment we can get high quality result higher quality results uh, with a much smaller number of samples so if we take the same pattern and we just rotate it each time which i think you can see here nope that's just a different oh no yep that's probably the sound i'm trying to look for this kind of a uh, small triangular cluster in this is this not rotated we'll see but yeah we're going to take a pattern and we're going to rotate it and we're going to sample there. Um, oh, I suppose this is a sphere, so it could be rotating in a way that's not producing the same pattern each time. That's fine. Um, below is an image courtesy of John Chapman. So this is John Chapman's blog. And if I remember correctly, this person has a good tutorial on this same effect. Uh, so we might look there for clues as well. But this is showcasing the bounding. It's just like, here, we've not got enough data. Um, yeah. As you can see, even though we get a noticeable banding on the SSA, SSO results due to low sample count, by introducing some randomness, uh, the banding effects are completely gone. Yeah, pretty much. Um, there's also some blurring that's going on here, so I'm guessing that's important. The SSO AO method developed by Crytek has a certain visual style. Because the sample kernel was a sphere, it caused flat walls to look gray well that makes sense yeah because like a bunch of the samples are going to be inside okay yeah so your sample positions are in 3d space but the information you've got is kind of like pseudo 3d in a way you have a depth and you uh, no, yeah i mean you have a 3d skin i suppose that you know about you don't you just have to assume that things that are further away are inside an object i guess it causes flat walls to look grey as half of the kernel samples end up being in the surrounding geometry. Below is an image of crisis screen space and free space ambient occlusion that clearly portrays this grey feel. So this kind of thing. For that reason, we won't be using a sphere to sample uh, a sphere sample kernel, but rather a hemisphere oriented along the surface's normal vector. Okie dokie. So something like this, apparently. And yeah, then we're going to count things that are count the number of samples that are whose depth in the kind of screen space is further than the depth we have stored in the depth buffer by sampling around this normal oriented hemisphere we do not consider the fragments underlying geometry as contribution to the occlusion factor this removes the gray feel of ambient occlusion generally produces more realistic results this SSA SSO tutorial is based on this normal oriented hemisphere method slightly modified and, and a slightly modified version of John Chapman's brilliant SSAO tutorial. Okay, here it is. Here is the one. So this is his one. So we'll keep this open just in case it becomes useful. And um, what about other objects that are in front? I guess we need more than a depth buffer. I mean, if it's like we're only going to be generating um, because this is like a screen space post -pro uh, processing thing. If there's an object in front, then that's the only one we need uh, ambient, like uh, yeah, ambient inclusion information for, um, at least in the region that it's overlapping. So let's say we've got we've got a big sphere here. Uh, where are you? There we go. Whoop. Oh, there's a big blob here, and it's opaque. Then we need to calculate um, ambient occlusion information for it. And we're going to calculate ambient occlusion for everywhere else as well. But we don't need to have ambient occlusion behind this object. It does mean, I guess, you have slightly less data. I guess that's why you don't consider things that are in front but are only behind. Uh, because, yeah, there's going to be lots of samples that are nearer than your object because, yeah, there's loads of other objects. So, yeah, this can be interesting. Sample buffers. SSAO requires geometrical information as we need some way to define the occlusion factor of a fragment. For each fragment, we are going to need the following data. A per fragment position vector, a per fragment normal, per fragment albedo, a sample kernel, a per fragment random rotation vector um, used to rotate the sample kernel. So, again, these are going to be very familiar if you were around for when we were doing um, deferred lighting, deferred rendering. Um, we are going to 
yes, we're going to have to do one pass where we store a whole bunch of information into a load of buffers, to a load of, yeah, into a load of uh, textures, essentially. And then we are going to read them back and use them in later passes. And we are, our goal is at least to get this bit done. And then we'll consider doing this, um, which is the blur on, on the SSAO information. And we'll probably ignore the lighting pass unless we get really into it another week. But this is really what we want to get done. This is going to be the bit that's the most illuminating. Har. Okay. Um, using a per fragment view space position. Okay, so, so this is important. We're going to be storing all this information. It's been mentioned a couple of times, actually. The information that we're going to be storing is in view space, not in world space. And I'm pretty sure when we did our deferred lighting before, we did everything in world space because we were being lazy. So we're going to have to very much keep that in mind because if we do things in mixed spaces or in the wrong spaces, it is going to be a problem. Um, also, like we could do it in world space technically, but I don't want to go trying to modify a tutorial that I already don't understand. So we're just going to follow along and try and do what we're meant to do. Okay. Um, okay, let's... Uh, Okay, so using a per fragment view space position, we can orient a sample hemisphere kernel around the fragment's view space uh, surface normal and use this kernel to sample the position buffer texture at varying offsets. For each per fragment kernel sample, we compare its depth with its depth in the... Oh, right, okay, like we can. So for each sample we make up, so each position we want to consider, we compare that with the depth um, in the position buffer to determine the amount of occlusion. So if it's further away than the depth buffer indicates, then okay, that's that's something that's occluding. That's adding to the occlusion factor. And again, like I, th I guess it is worth noting at this point, from from everything we're seeing here, while this is being guided by some kind of logic that comes from the real world, that you know, like. When we have these dis disparities in depth, we have some kind of corner that needs less light. This doesn't seem to be making any attempt to be technically correct. So there's no mention here of like the actual typical fall-offs of the number of photons and all that kind of stuff that you would get in these kind of spaces or any attempt to dictate what shape space we're getting. We're just like, here's a discontinuity, darken things. Um, so that's cool. Something like that. Also, by including a per-fragment rotation vector, we can significantly reduce the number of samples we'll need to take, as we'll soon see. Will we now? Will we now? Okay. So we'll probably want... This is going to be our first bit that we're going to set up. Um, and that's cool. So and as SSAO is a screen space technique, we calculate its effect on each fragment on a screen-filled 2D quad. Pretty typical. We do that all the time. But this means we have no geometrical information of the scene. True, yes. All we have are the... Like we have the kind of color information and we have a bunch of depths. I mean, well, here we've got, you know, world position. So positions. Um, so they're vector threes, but that's it. Um, we also have these normals here as well. But only for all of the, like, kind of your surface fragments. There's no, there's no data behind, like, at this point here, it's not like we also have the normal for his butt. Okay. Um, what we could do is render the geometrical per fragment data into screen space textures, and then we, and then we, and we then later send that. Sorry, that we. <laughs> Let's try that again. What we could do, we could do this, is to render the geometrical per fragment data into screen space textures that we then later send to SSAO shader, so that we have access to the per fragment geometrical data. Yes. And as we said earlier, this is a lot like we were doing with deferred rendering. Um, and it's one of the reasons it's really favorable because you, if you're doing deferred rendering, you already have all this information. And if you have all this information, you get this pretty much for free. Um, yeah. 
like I mean like it's still going to cost you some computation but not costing you any more memory which is great other than I suppose we have these rotation vectors we're passing in so maybe that matters Mfiano, hello we are starting to look at um, SSAO um, we're going to take a few weeks to today we're just kind of we're going to work through the article as far as we can without getting too confused and then we're going to try and set up the project so we're in a place to start implementing this um, and then over the next probably couple of weeks um, we'll uh, yeah we'll see how far we get and see if we can get something that makes sense all right um as we already have per fragment position and normal data available from the G buffer in the fragment shader. Okay, they already have that because they're building it on top of their old deferred rendering code. We're not, so we're going to have to implement that. Um, Fiana says, cool. Yeah, it is, man. It feel, it's been so long since I've really taken the time to do new graphical effects because I've just been a bit overwhelmed. And I'm, but I'm really ready to. It's, it's, been, it's been too long and it doesn't feel like we've pushed enough pixels. Um... But it's hard finding techniques that don't like take um, a lot of stuff. Am I doing the jam? Actually, I'm not sure that I'm going to have time to. I think I mentioned this already on the stream. Um, I'm getting... Yeah, I, I want to. I'm not sure if life's going to give me that kind of time at the moment. Um, which is a bummer, but we'll see. But uh, to anyone who is um, entering, if you're using Keppel, please do bug me on Discord. I'm normally... Av I'm available at some point in the day to answer questions. Um, yeah. You've been missing for a couple of weeks. Yeah, man. No, no, I meant, I mentioned in, uh, I mentioned earlier in this episode as well. I know you weren't, I know you weren't ruined. Okay. So this is a fragment stage that's reading in a position, a normal, an albedo spec. Oh no, sorry, this did not reading it at all. Look at the direction. These are outs. These are the outputs from this fragment shader. And they're gonna be going into, I guess, se like separate attachments in an FB um yeah, into an FBO, which is fine. We'll do the same. Um Yeah, that's cool. If you'd excuse me one second, I've got I just wanna blow my nose and I didn't leave a hanky here. Sorry about that. All right, let's get back to business. So all this is doing is this is the um, shader that is writing things into uh, those buffers. We can see that they're putting in fragpos, which is the screen space position of the fragment. Um, they're also putting in the normal. So again, this will be a... Oh no, wait a second, this is fragpos. Oh yeah, this isn't GL fragpos. This is their fragpos and their normal. So this is assuming that we've already got it into view space in the previous, passing that in for the previous stage. So we'll have to have a look at that. Since SSAO is a screen space technique, where occlusion is calculated based on the visible view, it makes sense to implement the algorithm in view space. Therefore, the frag pos, um, as supplied by the geometries, the vertex shader is transformed to view space. Okay, when they're talking about, it's just kind of confusing terminology, they're talking about the geometry stage. When you talk about deferred rendering, there's a first stage where you're rendering Kind of all that geometry information and albedo and a bunch of other things into the buffers and then they have a what do they call it i guess the deferred stage where you're um where you're using all that information so that's really annoying because geometry geometry stage of the pipeline is a completely separate thing um yes so because it would be a geometry shader and this is talking about the geometry shape stages vertex stager which is just 
annoying terminology, but it's what we've got to work with. Um, it's saying, therefore, the frag posit supplied by the geometry sh stages vertex shader is transformed um, to view space, which is interesting because they don't do any transformation here at all. They take frag posit and they shove it straight into G position. So I'm not sure what that transform they're talking about is going on here. I mean, they normalize the normal. That's fine because we don't want to have that interpolation that can happen across vertices to change the magnitude of the normal, the magnitude of the vector, and make it not a normal normal. Um, and they're shoving in the per fragment color for whatever reason. Um, oh, sorry, the per fragment color. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's the albedo. So this is what you're reading out of a texture, I suppose. Um, G albedo spec is vec3 0.95 okay so they're just picking a solid color that's fine okay so if we were to have a quick look at our stages here let's see what passes we've got when we're rendering stuff is this frag stage a thing pipeline it's the asymp vert stage i think we're looking for is the first part of our pipeline Oh, we've got a, a function that does the bulk of this work that we obviously reuse some code here. Um, let's jump into that. But here we can see that we have um, a position, which is in model space, and we've scaled it for some reason and made it into a VEC4 um, with a one on the end because we're treating it as a position. Um, there's our world position where we take the model to world matrix and multiply this position by it. We get our world position. We've got our model, our world to view matrix to transform that into the view position. So that's something we're very interested in there. There's the position in view space that we're interested in. So we're going to pass that along in our new stage, in our new shader. Um, there's the normal in world space. So we actually need the normal in view space, I guess. Um, and we and this is the clip position, um, which is the first value that's returned from the um, vertex stage. So that, that that's fine. We won't we won't mess with that. We also have the construction of the um, the tangent base uh, matrix here. So I'm not sure what we're going to do with that just yet, but that will be interesting. So we'll come back to that later. How do we what how do we create that anyway? We have the tangent and we have the bitangent and we have the normal. We use that to create the, the matrix we're interested in. I guess what we'll do is we'll take that that um, pipeline, we'll copy it, and we'll start messing around with it. We'll strip out all the things that aren't related to what we're doing right now. Um, and we'll yeah, we'll try and construct something a bit more appropriate for this. Um, let's have a look. What ragings are going on in the chat? Um, <laughs> people trying to take over the stream. Good luck from your tiny text position, you non-comporeal fucks. Right. Um, probably got banned off Twitch for doing that for that brilliant idea. Um, Metian is setting position of the cameras. Um... Hey, Pixel Owl. See you in a bit. Okay, let's see if we can read a bit further without going too crazy, and we'll, we'll then we'll start making changes. Again, I don't want to dive in too quickly, but, you know, we've got time. We've got a few weeks. It is possible to reconstruct the actual position vectors from depth values alone using some clever, clever tricks as Matt Patino, as Patino, Patino describes in his blog. This requires some extra calculations in the shaders, but saves us from having to store position data in the G-buffer, which costs us a lot of memory. For the sake of a simple shader, we'll leave these optimizations out of the tutorial. Yeah, like if you've got depth information, you've got everything you need to reconstruct. Like you know which direction you're coming at, you know the other things, then you could reconstruct positions. 
I'm not sure if you, like, like the depth, I think the depth buffer is non-linear by default because you want more precision of things that are closer than things that are further away. So that's going to be interesting on how much precision you'd get from things that are further away. But this technique does sound interesting. This sounds like it would be quite a good candidate for making a helper function that we can st stick in Nineveh. So I think maybe we'll do this another week. This could actually be quite a good... Um, this could be a fun little project, actually. Yeah, make a little helper function, stick, get it into Nineveh. Cool. Okay, so the position color buffer texture is configured as follows. So this is like where we're going to shove those positions. Uh, we can see... I do love this stuff. This is really cool. Right into the documentation. Yeah, we have... They're creating a texture, they're binding a texture, they're doing all the stuff that we don't really have to do in Keppel to get things set up. Um, they, they're using 16-bit floats. It's a three-component vector in the texture. Um, and... We have a width and a height and some other stuff that's kind of implicit in my mind. Floats, yeah. Um, we're going to set the, the filters, min and mag, the minify and magnify filters to nearest, which means we're not going to do interpolation. Um, that's interesting, actually. We just go to the nearest fragment. Fair enough, if that's the way it's done. Um, I think that's correct. We'll have to have a look at that to see what the options are. We'll get to that in a minute. And we have the wrapping setting saying clamp to edge, which is again, is easy for us to set up. Um, so this in Keppel, let's just go and let's copy this over. We'll make a file called foo, which we're just going to use for notes. Damn it, there's already one called foo. It's called bar, because I have great naming. Greatest naming of all time. Um, and so this is going to be something like... Let's just do this. Okay, so if we're going to do this in Keppel, we would do make texture. Um, we would enable concurrent hints so I can actually see the stuff down here. Um, initial contents are going to be nil. The dimensions are going to be whatever the size of the screen is. So I'm just going to dimensions foo right now. Um, the element type is going to be a vec. Have we got a half vec3? That's exactly what we want. Um, we're not doing anything with mip mapping, I don't think. So mip map is nil. Um, layer count one cubes. No, we're not doing cube uh, textures. Not doing rectangles. We are using immutable storage. Um, we're not using buffer storage. We're not generating mip maps. Um, I think that's implicit from the fact that mip map is nil anyway. Um, pixel format we don't have to specify. I'll be calculated samples, fixed sample locations. All of that's fine. Um, yes. So this would give us. An error. Uh, oh yeah, foo is not not bound. Get back here. Oh. Do, 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 do. I'm guessing this is what Marianne was telling me to use, uh, which is some sensible positions. Let's actually try it. Like set f. Do, do, do. This is what I was sent. Bam. Okay. Marianne, you're good. Look at that. Excellent. So let's go into play with verts and. When we reset, there's probably somewhere we set the camera position. Um, oh yeah, it's probably in reset camera. And there it is. There's our old one. Get rid of that. Bam. Lovely. Okay. Medianza was ahead. Love it. Okay, so now we need to know the size of the screen as a vector 2, which is easy to get. If I can just remember, it will be viewport uh, resolution um, of the current viewport. If we have that, and there it is, perfect. So now we can go up to our make texture, and instead of foo, we do this. And this is not a number. Well, fuck you. No, it's not. 
Um, I guess it wants that as a list because that's the kind of thing that a list normally expects as dimensions as a list. Maybe we should support that as a vector too as well. Um, doesn't seem to be too harmful to do that, but anyway. Um, I normally have dimensions as the list version, so viewport dimensions of current viewport is the same thing but as a list. So let's just change this to dimensions. And from that we get a texture. So therefore tab zero will set this up properly soon. Oh fuck you, buddy. Ah did it wrong. Did it wrong. Okay. Um Fuck that, let's just do this again. Set of temp zero. We've leaked a little GPU memory, oh no. It's not the biggest mistake we're gonna make today. Okay, so we get our texture, and then we want to be able to sample it. So set of temp one is going to be sample uh, temp zero. And here we're gonna say our minify filter is um, nearest. Our magnify filter is nearest, and our, do we specify wrapping here as well? Ah, oh, we can, yeah. So we do wrap, and then we want to use clamp to edge. There we go, right. And that would give us a sample, sampler for that texture. So temp zero, temp one. That would be cool. So that's roughly what we're going to do to create those things when we get around to it. Um, so that feels good. Yes. So yeah, in this case, we are whenever we're sampling from this thing, if it's smaller or larger than its original thing, we just jump to the nearest um, texel. Do do do. Clamp to edge, so we don't when we sample from one edge, like. Here we don't start wrapping around and some and reading from the other edge. Um, that's really cool. Um, next, we need the actual hemisphere sample kernel and some method to randomly rotate it. So a normal oriented hemisphere. Let's have a look at this as well. We need to generate a number of samples oriented along the normal of a surface. As we briefly discussed at the start of this tutorial, we want to generate samples that form a hemisphere. As this is difficult, as it is difficult nor plausible to generate, interesting language, but yeah, to generate a sample kernel for each surface normal direction, we're gonna generate a sample kernel in tangent space with the normal vector pointing in the positive z direction, okay. That was a lot of things. So basically, yeah, we're going to generate one hemisphere that we're going to treat as in tangent space, and then we'll, um, yeah, we'll, we'll create a matrix for that, I guess, uh, to transform the results as we need it. We'll, we'll see how that works. We'll see. Assuming we have a unit hemisphere, we can obtain a sample kernel with a maximum of 64 samples as follows. Let's have a look at this. Let's take this. We'll dump it in a file again. Not like that. And let's see. Okay, so they're generating themselves. I guess this is a thing that generates, yes, a uniform real distribution. That's another thing we need to do on one of our streams. We don't have any functions. We, we should we should have a selection of random fu randomization functions that we can use with certain properties, like being able to be like uniformly distributed numbers and things like this. Um, that would be a good thing to do. If anyone has any resources on that kind of stuff, it'd be really cool to see, especially if there are GPU Im implementations as well. That would be dope. Um, Darius is saying, I'll be lost without th those il illustrations. Me too, man. Totally. <laughs> I'm just like, most of these things like, yes, these sound like words. So far, so good. Um, so yes, we're going to have a thing that generates random floats between 0 and 1. Cool. And then they're creating a vector. I guess this is for the results. Um, and then we're going to go for i below 64. We are going to generate a random float. Well, three random floats. One being used for x, one being used for y, and one being used for z. 
but these two we're going to multiply by two and minus one and all we're doing there is we're remapping from the zero to one range into the minus one to one range right so what we end up with if i'm reading this correctly is a very bad diagram where zero to one in this axis which is going to be z not two z and then from minus one to one in this axis which is x and also in y which we can't show here but is going directly at our face in this case um, and so we're going to have a load of points being generated in here which are random but apparently uniformly distributed and then it's going to normalize them which is going to push them out to the surface of a of a hemisphere so if we have a center here and this is obviously one all of these are going to get pushed out to that surface so wherever they are if they're further away they come back because again normalize is going to make the length of the vector one so this vector here oops to make it one is going to push the point over to here and then now we got a load of random points on the surface of a hemisphere but to get a load of ra random points inside the hemisphere then it multiplies the float the sample in this case they're calling it by another random um, random floating point number between zero and one so that's not gonna they push them up to the surface and then they bring them back to be somewhere within this range and then the float scale equals i divided by 64 and then they don't use this so this line isn't used yet by the look of it can you see scale anywhere i can't that's uh whoops scale so i'm guessing that's something they're putting in so they can use it later don't confuse me like that right so let's cross that out again Blurb. And then they push this onto the end of this vector. And so we're going to do the 64 times, which is going to keep generating random samples within this hemisphere and then um, pushing them onto the vector. Now, there's one bit I don't, I'm not sure about this because you're generating uniform positions within this cuboid, right? And then you're going to flatten them out to a to the surface of the hemisphere. Now in my head, that means that you're actually gonna get a bit of clustering of points around this place here. Because if you have a bunch of points here, they're all gonna map down. Like if I can do a better diagram of this maybe. If we artificially make some uniform points here, very uniform. Oops. Whatever, something like that. And then we map them down towards the center. So here and here and here and here and here. There'll be two there because they're the same. And three around here and two around here. And like, I think you get clustering around where the corner was. And then you're going to pull them back in, which is like, yeah, it's all right. But don't you still end up with more points clustered around there? The way I would have thought you would generate this really is you would start with a random angle. So you would pick. You wouldn't have this. You would. Yeah, you would have your hemisphere <laughs> dodgily drawn and you would pick a random angle. And then you would pick a random distance and then that would give you your uniform positions. Um, I've also seen some other. I think it's called the Hammersley technique. Let's see if I can find it because I'm pretty because I was I remember looking into that um, when I was doing some PBR code. Um, let's have a look. 
Nineveh, what things do we have? Color, conditionals, distortion, easing, GPU, graphing. GPU, that's pretty fucking useful, isn't it? Oh, there's nothing in there. Cool. Um, graphing, hashing, internals, math primitives, mesh. Uh, um, clamping, that's nope, just saturate, log, mod, these are just different implementations of things, remap, vmax, oh, yeah, mathus and vectors, fine, maxus and vectors, rather, um, mesh, I don't think it's going to be in there, no, that's about primitives, noise and normals, no, that's just calculating normals from some points, um, random, Hammersley, there we go. Hammersley Nth Hemisphere. So this is an, a document that tells us about it. Oh, not trusted now. It's too temporarily. Okay, so it is a system that generates uniform points across a 2D grid. You can then remap that onto a hemisphere using these functions. So you say, hey, I want up to, I want, I want 16 values. And then you pass in which member of that series that you want. So you say 16, 0, 16, 1, 16, 2, 16, 3. And that gets you all these positions um, from this hemisphere. So I would use something like that um, and then scale them. Um, as you can see, these are GPU functions. So this is just something that's nice to use on the GPU. It's an efficient way of getting a point on a hemisphere. And, you know, pretty cool. And it's already in Nineveh. Again, Nineveh. Really need to document it someday because maybe we'll do... How um how sucky is um <laughs> Metian saying the flicker is gonna probably make this video huge. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, it's gonna have to well, yeah, no, that's true. It's probably a bit more than we would normally need. Um Pucker Pop is having some issues with sound, but gladly I think everyone else is okay so far with it. Um <laughs> it might be because of the flickering light. Oh, thank you for the link as well. Yes, that is Hammersley on Hemisphere. Super useful article. Again, that's used when we do a lot of um, sampling across Hemisphere stuff when we're dealing with... Um... Oh, what was it for in the PBR? That was, I think, sampling some of the environment information or stuff like this. I remember doing these kind of weighted um, lobes that you sampled. Ah, oh, fuck. It's, it's all gone. It's in there somewhere, but it's, it's out of my head at the moment. What's also in random? Oh yeah, it's just a classic, one of the classic random functions, which gives a really aggressive, um, kind of a really aggressive noise. <sighs> we could do the documentation for Nineveh on some streams at some point. I'm not sure if that makes for good. Holy fucking Jesus, what is going on? Um, this stream needs more PHP. Indeed, I, I'm fine with that. Welcome in, but there's a lot more parens. This is a language that's actually uglier than PHP, so um, you should feel right at home. This is good. Right, so where do we get to? Back onto the document here. Um, assuming we have a unit hemisphere, yes. So this is about generating those positions. I still think that this is going to give clustering around the like rectangle that we were talking about when we are doing the sampling. Um, but it's not going to be a big deal for this. It's not going to create any... We just don't have to give a shit about this. So it's fine. Ugly on a PHP. <laughs> yep, bring in the friends, man. Um, cool. We vary the X and Y direction in tangent space between minus 1 and 1 and vary the Z direction of the samples between 0 and 1. Yeah, this is just telling us what we've already looked at in the code. Um... Currently, all the samples are randomly distributed in the sample kernel. I disagree, but good enough. Um, but we'd rather place a large weight on occlusions close to the actual fragments as to distribute the kernel samples closer to the origin. We can do this in the accelerating interpolation function. 
So he's just going to grab a number of the points from this series and it's going to drag them closer to the center of this hemisphere here. Um, and so they're all they're doing in this case is... Um, oh yeah, we're going to actually use that scale value that was mentioned up here. Remember this one that just didn't do shit? Um, we've got it here uh, and we're going to scale that. And we, So we're going to be lerping between 0 0.1 and 1 based on the square of that scale. And we've seen already that the scale is the um, i divided by 64. So yes, I mean, just to save us some time, we could do the graphing ourselves to see what's going on. Um, <sighs> Print the sailor is saying, this is the language you use if you can't pronounce the letter. <laughs> Proof positive. <laughs> you people are just here with the wisdom, aren't you? Um, where lerp is defined as, that looks like a pretty standard implementation of lerp. Let's make sure that mine is not made of nonsense and or balls. So, so RTG math is probably already loaded. So let's just go and look for lerp. No, we are not those kind of people. We're different kind of spots. Lerp, yes, is... Um, Okay, this is actually a slightly dodgy implementation by the look of it. Yeah, fair enough. We can live with that. Okay, so we're living between A and B by this factor. So A plus F times, let's just have a look at that to make sure that I'm not going mad here. Times B minus A. So that's going to be our range. So it's A plus this multiplied by the range. Pretty sure this is like a low accuracy lerp. I remember having this as like, this is the kind of first kind of implementation you would come up with. But it seems a bit janky to me. I remember having a discussion with people about this before. I'm not sure, what's the uh, GLSL lerp look like? <laughs> yeah. It prevents overflow. What? Um, I'm not sure. It's this thing. It's just I'm not even sure what you're referring to now. It rubs the parens on its skin and also gets the hose again. That's all I know. Um... Yes, this is the lerp as it's defined by GLSL. And so we're doing a very similar one to this. I think that's the implementation I've got, uh, which is less prone to error. Um, I think the one that they're using here is more prone to it. But whatever, man, I, I don't care. Um, we'll use whatever we've got. And if it starts being a problem, we'll fuck around with it some more. Um, yeah, sorry to the people who have just kind of turned up yelling about PHP. There's not going to be that much coding today because we're just going through this technique at the moment to see what kind of shit we can do. Um, and it's going to be probably like more in other weeks so we're actually implementing the SSAO shiz. Um, that's if you're actually interested in that at all. Anyway. Um, there's only one way to do a straight lab. All right. Well... This is the way that GLSL does it. So I'm assuming that's your one true way, and this is the dodgy way. Um, this gives us kernel distribution that places most samples closer to the origin. Yeah, so there's the thing we were talking about. We're just taking a bunch of the samples, weighted by this, and dragging them a bit closer, and that is fine. And then this random kernel rotation shares. So, okay, so by introducing some randomness to the sample kernels, we largely reduce the number of samples necessary to get good results. We could create a random rotation vector for each fragment that's seen. But again, why? Um, let's just pre-compute a bunch of them and shove them into a little texture. So we're going to do um, a 4x4 four four array of uh, random rotation vectors. As they were saying here, we'll shove them into a 4x4 yeah, four four texture, and then we can just tile that across the scene. Um, and yeah, Zula and I was saying, yeah, time to rewrite my lerps. Yeah, check it out, man. Um, 
<laughs> TS Outing. Correct. That's my favorite program. Um, that's cool. Again, this is this is simple enough. Again, they're using. Why are they using? Ah, oh, it doesn't matter. Whatever. Yeah. So he's generating a couple of uh, floats between zero and one, remapping them from minus one to one, creating some vec threes out of that, and shoving it into this vector here, which is eventually going to be thrown into a texture, I guess. Or we might shove it in a UBO or an SSBO, whatever we really feel like. We're not too worried about GL version here, so it's not going to be a big deal. Um, as the sample kernel is oriented around the positive Z direction in tangent space, we leave the Z component as zero. Again, at that point, why store it, you know? Like, you you can reconstruct that for free um, when you create your vector, like when you're sampling this on the GPU. But then again, again, it's 16... It's, yeah, it's not many floats. It's 16 vectors. It's not a big deal. Um, we're just doing a shitty implementation anyway. We then create a four by four texture. Oh yeah, we're going for the texture route. Oh right, so then you're holding essentially a vector four. No, no. Um, I was about to say you're holding a vec four anyway, but that's bollocks. When you sample, you get a vector four, but that's not the storage, of course. Um, make sure it's wrapping is set to repeat. So we can see here, instead of clamping, we're wrapping. Um, again, we're using nearest for our sampling. See, I understand using nearest for this. I'm not so sure about using nearest for the other one yet, but we'll, that, we'll get to that. Um, that might be correct. I suppose actually our G buffers are gonna be the same size as our final output. So yeah, maybe it makes sense just to not worry about the interpolation and just say, yeah, grab the nearest one. Okay, so this is gonna be our noise texture and yeah, that's fine. We could always use one of our noise functions as well if we didn't wanna bother with this, but we'll try and follow this implementation fairly closely on our first go and then we can try and dick around with it and see what we get. Again, there's a few more cycles to use in the GPU, but maybe we don't care. And apparently we have all the relevant input data, sure. Let's go with that. So you're going to render out, I guess we've already rendered out um, the view space position, view space normal, and we've got these. Was there anything else? What was the other things? I remember there being a third input. What the fuck is this one? Um, oh, this is, this is the per fragment albedo color because wasn't this just the same everywhere? Yeah, look, see? 0.95, which is basically white. So I guess that's the point there is like we saw earlier. By setting everything to be the same color, we get absolutely no definition. So any shadows we get are going to be based on the um, SSAO and not based on any other things that are baked into the textures or anything like that. Um, Jace, yo! Um... So let's get down to what apparently is the SSAO shader. So they're generating some frame buffer objects. What are we going to do here? Um, there's a, okay, let's read what we've got. Runs on a 2D screen fill quad that calculates the occlusion value for each of the generated fragments for use in the final lighting shader. Okay, right. So yes, this is going to, yeah, we're doing an SSAO pass. And we're just trying to generate that occlusion information. As we need to store the result of the SSAO stage, we create yet another frame buffer object. And that's all that's going to be in there. There's going to be a single attachment. Um, is that right? No. Wait a second. I'm generating a frame buffer. I'm binding the fucker. Um, and then I'm saying... Doot, doot, doot. Making the texture. Binding the texture. Get out of my face. Um, setting it all up like when you initially do these binds you set a lot of the you're setting a bunch of the information um, it is a single component floating points um, 
texture. We've got GL RGB here, which is interesting. Ah, uh, I can't remember. Okay, but this this to me looks like single component. Um, and then, yeah, we're doing nearest filtering and we are doing... Oh yeah, here we are attaching the single attachment onto our FBO here. But we're not going to worry about that too much. Again, this is relatively simple stuff for us to do with Kettle. I mean, we've done it a bunch of times. Generate an FBO, we can set the attachment really easy. We know we can make texture simply and setting all this kind of crap will be fine. So nothing really to be concerned about here. As the ambient occlusion result is a single grayscale value, we'll only need the texture's red component. Thus, we set the color buffer's internal format to red. What are you? What the fuck are you? I can't remember. Um, the complete process for rendering. Actually, we could just hover over this. It'll probably tell us. Target, level, internal formats. Then further down, formats. So it specifies the format of the pixel data. So maybe that's for upload? Uh, pixel format stuff always gives me a sodding headache. You have to read so much for that. And I know I've got to refactor all the um, pixel transfer code in Kettle at some point, which is going to be pain. I tried doing it before, but it just, yeah, it was too mind-numbing, so I had to stop for a while. Where are we? Render stuff into the G-buffer. Okay, yes. G-buffer pass. Unbind the frame buffer. Bind the frame buffer for the uh, SSAO stuff. Clear it. Um, set the textures. Again, we don't have to do this kind of stuff because we're using Kettle. Um, then we're going to... Jesus Christ. One of these is actually going to do something. Um, there's a bunch of helper functions here. Setting the projection matrix, which is interesting because we haven't talked about that yet. And rendering the quad. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff. But we can also look at their code. But I, I think a lot of this boils down to a much smaller code in Lisp, so I'm not really worried about that. Um, Pinpin says, hello. Hello. Um, Zulu Inno is just saying, just read up on the lerping. And no kidding, this might actually fix some corner cases at work. Oh, great to hear, man. What are you working on at the moment? But yeah, I got... um. I got bothered by, I can't remember who it was that really was pushing me to fix my lerps ages ago in ArchG Math. I think it was Enfiano. Um, that sounds like someone who would be bugging me about some technical details quite a lot. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it, it was correct. It did need doing. Um, the other one straight up wrong. Or at least, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's wrong. You don't want that error. Um, the shader SSAO... Oh, God. Okay, so it's taking and input the relevant G-buffer textures, the noise texture, and the normal-oriented hemisphere kernel samples. Whew. Okay, so... So it's actually passing up those array of samples just as a uniform. We might shove them in a UBO because we're kind of lazy. It's just really easy for us to do, so it doesn't complicate our code to do that. Um... Yeah, so the, the textures that are written into from the first pass, um, and then the samples, the projection matrix we're going to have to see about soon. Some noise scale? Okay, fine. This is about, oh yeah, this is for, this looks like it's for generating, to scale the UVs so that you can, yeah, scaling the UVs so you, you're sampling um, outside of the, um, noise texture, so we take advantage of that wrapping. So basically, this is the tiling the image across the whole um, frame. D-U-Q-N-D. Thanks for coming, man. Yeah, good to have you here too. And yeah, see you on the next one. Um, Zuluin has been doing some geospatial stuff. This might fix some issues I've been having calculating raster data at boundaries between areas I have data for. Really cool. That worked out well then. So that's it. Bonus points for random PHP brigade or whoever they were. Are they still around, by the way? Have we got... Yay! A bunch of them are still here. Welcome, welcome. Well, thanks for inadvertently helping us out. That was quite cool. Um, 
All right, this is, it's getting kind of to the point where like, we'll look a bit more at this, but it feels like we've got to start setting things up before we go too much further. Ah, there's not that much code. Let's just, let's just beast through this. Let's see what we get. Um, I want to write a bit of code this stream. I hate doing two hours with like having no real valuable coding going on. Um, okay, so interesting to note here is the noise scale there. Oh yeah, this is, we just said about this, tiling the noise across the screen. Fine. Um, so, yep, we sample the various textures so we can get the information in. No surprises there. Sampling the noise one multiplied by the noise scale, the UVs times the noise scale, um, or text chords. As we set the tiling parameters of text noise to repeat, the random values were repeated all over the screen. We'll see that later. Together with frag pos and normal vector, we then have enough data to create a TBN matrix. Um, I can't remember what this stands for. So, like, we did this before, and I always forget. Okay, so... Come on. TBN, TBN, TBN. Don't just call it... Ah, fuck you. <laughs> That's not what I needed. I need help. I need... I, I need help. Right. Let's go back to... Dun, 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 dun. Motherfucker, where are you? Uh, normal map. GBN. There we go. Tangent by tangent normal vector. That's what we're talking about. Awesome. Okay. That makes sense. So this is going to be our kind of tangent space that we're defining. So we're defining a, a we're defining this TBN matrix. We're defining a transform into that space. Um, so let's go back. Back, 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 back. Where are we? Okay. Okay, so yes, the tangent is going to be... So we normalize the random vector minus normal, and then we dot product the random vector onto normal. So dot product, dot product between two normal vectors uh, effectively gives us a projection of one to the other. Um, random vector minus normal. Um, so that's interesting. What's that going to be? So if we have, that is the worst, okay then. Um, yeah, if we have one vector going this way, and another motherfucker, uh, one going this way, if we say this is our random one. <laughs> what the shit? Why are you scrolling everywhere? This is not helping. I'm a professional. Let's try that again. So they're saying something along the lines of, hey, you have a, this is gonna be our normal vector. Let's call it N. And then we've got some other random vector. Why is alt scrolling? All right. This is our random one. Um, oh, Firefox. Oh, no, it's not. We're just hiding that bar up at the top. Let's just take a second to focus this shit over here. Which hides everything. Oh, I use the best tools. Right, where do we go? Normalize, here we go. <laughs> we subtract one from the other and then we multiply it by the projection of one to another. So dot of one onto another is gonna give you the magnitude of this here. And so you're subtracting this from this, which would give you this, and then you're scaling it down. Okay. But then you're normalizing it anyway. Oh wait, of course you're doing this first, aren't you? Oh, 
Okay, yeah. So this is just creating the tangent vector, but it was just an interesting way of... It's a way I don't remember doing. This is apparently called the Gram-Schmidt process. We build this up. I remember like being able to like get the tangent and then doing the cross product between the normal and the tangent, and then you've got one that is perpendicular to both of them, and then you can create your um, yeah your TBM from that. That makes some sense, but I just don't remember the logic behind this. But that is fine. We can just trust in the codes and we will proceed because if we take all day to try and make me understand everything. Then it's not going to happen because I'm an idiot. Um, great and an orth orthogonal basis, or an orthonormal basis, I think is also correct. Um, each time slightly tilted based on the value of random vec. Um, note that because we use, oh, okay, so yeah, we're just subtracting that from the normal and fucking around with it a bit. Fine. Um, note that because we use a random vector for constructing the tangent vector, there is no need to have a TBN matrix exactly aligned to the geometry service, thus no need for per vertex tangent and bitangent vectors okay we do have that though like we have that because we we use it for the normal mapping so don't know um next we iterate over each of the kernel samples um they transform transform the samples from tangent to view space add them to the current fragment position and compare the fragment depth so this is the meat and potatoes of everything next we iterate over the, each of the can the kernel samples so this is our kernel size, and we're going to go and index into that, which we're going to stick it in a UBO. Um, and then we multiply it by the TBN. Isn't that going to get us it in from tangent to view space? Okay, so that is the tangent to view space matrix. Oh, yeah, because the normal, I suppose the normal vector is in view space. So I have my transform direction in the wrong way. It was a matrix transforming from tangent to view. Yeah, of course, because you're using the normal as up. Yeah, that actually makes some sense. Um, sorry, folks, I got a bit distracted there, like on, <laughs> on the actual thing. Um, Fire Days, what browser? This is Firefox, um, as was answered by Darius. And yeah, we've got a, a bunch of shit going on. Uh, vertical tabs and that kind of stuff. Doot, doot, doot. Darius is saying, yeah, we had already done, but don't know if the code is still around. It is still around. We've got, depending on which episode it was, there is a branch for every episode that we've done so far. Um, per vertex tangent. Yeah, that's like, yeah, we definitely had that stuff before. In fact, if we go back to render, we can see. Yeah, here's tangent and bitangent. Actually, we were looking at them earlier in the episode. We have this data uh, passed into our... Well, we're, we're passing it into this common function here. So if we jump back down to the GPU function down here, we can see that um, we have the TB data, which is the tangent and bitangent data, which is a second um, GPU buffer that we're reading from which is holding data along with these vertices. So it's these are iterated over at the same time. Um, and so the vertex information is a combination of these two. We don't need this file. Open. Okay, so that sounds okay. And that's so we're transforming it into that view space. I will trust <laughs> as usual that that is correct. And then we're doing fragpos plus sample times radius. So, okay. I guess this is the... Where is this frag cost coming from, though? Oh, that's the one we read out of the... Me? Oh, from our textures. So we add our sample position to that. And this is multiplied by the radius. Okay, so our radius is coming from where? That's kind of annoying. Here, kernel size and radius are variables that we can use to tweak the effect. In this case, 64 and 5 respectively. For each iteration, we first transform the respective sample to view space, then we add the view space kernel offset sample to the view space fragment position. We then multiply the can. Yeah, that's fine. Um, we then multiply the offset sample by radius to increase or decrease the effective sample radius of the SSAO. 
That's interesting. I, mean, I suppose, yeah, we, we've created a, a, a hemisphere w which radius is one, right? And then we've got samples that are somewhere within there. So we can scale that up to wherever we like, and we still have our uniformly distributed samples within that hemisphere. So that's cool. No problem with that. Um, as the vector is currently in view space, we'll transform it to clip space using the... Okay, so we've got a bunch of stuff in view space. Fucking hell, right? Next, we want to transform sample to screen space so we can sample the position depth value of sample as if we were rendering it to its position directly to the screen. Fine. As a vector is currently in view space, we'll transform it to clip space first using the projection matrix uniform. I suppose that makes sense. That's interesting though. So I'm guessing we're using the depth buffer from an earlier pass as well. We might definitely have to check on our um on our um deferred rendering episode. Because if they're going to compare it with a depth buffer, then that depth buffer must have come from somewhere. It must have come from the geometry pass, like the pre-pass we did where we rendered all the geometry into the G buffers. Not sure. We'll have a look at that. Um, okay, so we're going to multiply. We're just doing the same treatment we would for a view um, thing to get it into clip space. So if we look in our, our code up here, um, to clip our view to clip matrix here so we go from view position to clip position and they're talking about using the perspective matrix if we go and see where this is set let's go and grab that quickly you can see that we are passing in the projection matrix that we get from our camera so when they're talking about hey we're going to use the projection here that matrix is our view to clip matrix here. So that's the same thing. So we, we've already got this information. Um, and then we divide it by W. This, this is the perspective divide. See, to me, that gets us into um, homogeneous coordinates, doesn't it? Or am I doing that wrong? Yes, and then transform in range 0 to, to 1. Yes, okay. So this is the final part of that transform. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that, that to me says screen space. That's fine. After the variables transformed to clip space, we yeah, we perform the perspective divide. This results in normalized device coordinates. I remembered a thing. Who fucking knew? He can be taught. Um, are then transformed in the zero to one range so we can use it to sample the position texture. Notice that this is zero to one, not zero to minus one, because in when you're finally in screen space, depth is actually depth is actually going into the screen again, as opposed to an eclipse space when uh, minus z is. Wait a second. Have I got that the wrong way around? Yeah, when positive z is out of the screen, negative z is into the screen. When you're in screen space, it's the other way around. Zero is here. One is in that direction, deeper in, which is a fuck, but it's fine. You have to deal with multiple spaces when you're doing this stuff anyway, so you just have to get used to that one too. Okay, so sample depth is texture of G position in offset X, Y, and Z. Okay. Hold your fucking horses. Um, okay, yeah, I suppose that that's right. Yeah. No, that, that actually makes sense. I was wondering a second ago if we were going to be doing this from the depth buffer. But no, we have that information, don't we? Um, one would assume. Because all of our... We're going to have stored... I thought we, the things we stored in G position was in view space. That's a bit funky. I'm going to have to look at this again when we come to actually implement it. But yeah, we use offset vectors X, Y component to sample the position texture to res res uh, to retrieve the depth or z value of the sample position as seen from the viewer's perspective. 
We then check that the sample's current depth value is larger than the stored depth value. We add um, to the final contributing factor. Yeah, fine, cool. So if it's larger than this, then, um, and we've got some bias factor here, so we can tweak it, then return one or zero, and we're gonna accumulate this information. That's gonna be our occlusion factor. Then we're gonna shove it in here. Apparently there's one last thing to do. Note that we have a small bias. Um, isn't always necessary, but it helps us tweak. Always worth shoving in some shit to tweak. We're not completely finished yet. What's the time? Jesus Christ, half nine. We haven't even started coding properly yet. This sucks. Okay, learning. I said I was going to take my time with this. God damn it. Why did I say that? Why can't we just code blindly and get it all wrong like usual? Okay, we're not completely finished. Is there still a small issue we have to take into account whenever a fragment is tested? Gramian occlusion that is aligned close to the edge of a surface will also consider depth values of surfaces far behind the test surface. Okay, so yeah, if we have an edge and we're sampling, we're going to sample over here and it's going to sample really far away. Oh, yeah, and that'd be a problem, I suppose. If you're on the edge, like, we have, if we have a ball here and we sample on the edge, then we're going to get the... We're going to get the depth of the ball. We're also going to get the depth of the wall that's 20 feet behind the ball. That's going to be a large discontinuity. And, um... Yeah. Yeah, then that might be considered as a thing that needs to be shadowed. So... We can solve this by introducing a range check. All oh, right, that makes sense. Yeah, if it's within the hemisphere, then we care about it. If not, then fuck off. That's fine. That makes a lot of sense. Apparently, we're using smooth step. Fine, that's okay. Smoother step. If that exists, we need to get it. If that is actually something generally agreed on, what smoother step is. This looks to me like smooth step raised to a very slight power but whatever. Um, we might add this to um, Nineveh, if that's useful. <laughs> Saying, coding blindly is fun. Yeah, we specialize in that here. So uh, I'm trying to be good and read this whole thing. Uh, it's not that long, but it's a lot to read out loud slowly, you know, with my distracted head. Um, Final step, we normalize the occlusion contribution by the size of the kernel and output the results. Note that we subtract the occlusion factor from one. So we can directly use the occlusion factor to scale the ambient lighting component. Yeah, so the greater the occlusion factor, the less light we want. So one minus a higher number <laughs> is going to give us a higher occlusion factor. You know, with, with a smaller number to which to scale the lighting by and apparently you get something like this whoopee doo okay right so that is more than a fucking enough let's go back and start dealing with some of the shit in the actual project so the first thing we really need is to deal with this we need to render out some of these positions so let's start getting ourselves some bits together um let's look at play with verts dot list how do we do this? When we're in the game step, we go in um, to draw stuff. We bind the FBO, the scene FBO. We clear it, we loop through all the things, we update those things, and then we draw all of the things. And then, then we draw whichever of the things um, are of type tile. And I now remember what that is. If we go over here, this is where I forked this episode off, was an, obviously an older project. If you guys remember, we were doing stuff with this guy before. This is our, um, when we were doing a cutaway shader. So this is a little effect to give a fake top to this. So we could do pixel perfect cutaway kind of stuff. Um, that was a lot of fun. So if we go and find Yeah, we should probably strip a bunch of this code out. Draw a fake top here. Cutaway height as a variable here. Let's go and have a look at it. Do, do, do. Cutaway height, yes. So if we set the cutaway height to be 8F0, we can chop it down some more, or we could set it to 1, and that's way too low. It's probably there somewhere. Um, 11, 
20. Oh, that's the whole thing. Cool. 18. No. 16. 14. We should really get the... We have to go back and do the UI stuff. But yeah, that, that's what it was all about. We were doing a cutaway shader. And it worked quite well. I still haven't gotten that, that into Tailspire, though. I will do at some point. I've got some big old rewrites coming. So that will be important then. But... I don't think we need to... Do, like, we've got more than enough to confuse us already. So I say let's remove all this shit and um, do a little bit of a cleanup. So, draw fake top. Where is that? We'll remove this. So now the fake top is gone. We will go and remove that method. So we don't need that anymore. Um, we've got this tile pipeline. I think we can just remove that in general. Tile pipeline. Here, tile fake top fragment stage, tile fake top pipeline. Cool. Is there anything else to do with tile in here? Yep, there's a tile frag. Ugh, fuck. Oh no, that's fine. Yep. Nothing else to do with tiles? No. Okay. Let's just grip this whole project for tile and just see what comes up. Test tile, we'll get rid of that. Um, we don't need a tile, get rid of that one. Um, let's just bring up the REPL again. Test tile, let's look in the things array and see if there is a tile in there. There is. So let's go set up things to be remove test tile from things cool that guy's gone so we don't have to worry about it anymore um let's go in here let's get rid of everything to do with drawing tiles that's nice and we're good so let's just commit that quickly um bar.lisp ah fuck it we don't need that we'll get back to it That was almost a useful comment message, which is highly irregular for this channel. 2142, it's time for that mad coding thing that we do right at the end and break everything. Yes! It's the bit. I live for this bit. Right. Um, what are we going to need? We are going to need an FBO for our... Because basically our gbuffer FBO. Let's do this. Def var. Um, def fact, of course. Um, gbuffer. FBO. Probably live to regret this naming, but it doesn't matter. Let's come down here. Let's go set F, gbuffer FBO, make FBO. We're going to do some attachments. We're going to have three attachments. What do we need to specify about them? Um, we might want to consider doing not that. We need to do that. And we can have a look into the things that we are going to store in there. Actually, no, this, this tutorial doesn't have that, but maybe not this one. You will not do. Let's go into the deferred shading stuff. Let's see what they recommend using for these buffers. See, in my head, this would be something like... For the first one, uh, we're going to be storing positions. So it, it's easier for me to use, like, to, like, the things that we can use for the attachments here can be arguments, the same arguments that make texture takes, and it generates the texture for us and does the basically all the setup. Um, but I like being able to <laughs> see these arguments while I'm writing. So initial content is going to be nil. Dimensions is going to be based on whatever the dimensions of the scene is. So, where's our reset FBOs shit? Um, come on, wait a second, really? 
lights as an FBO? That doesn't seem right. Oh, this is reset lights, that's why, you fucking moron. Why is that jumping to the wrong place? Here we go. Oh yeah, if you don't specify the dimensions, it's just gonna use the current viewport dimensions anyway. Perfect, thank you, Chris, it is useful. Okay, so we don't need to specify the dimensions, so we won't do that. Um, the element type, well, if it's position, then it's gonna be a VEC3, right? When we could use 16-bit, but you know, like we're not trying to conserve memory right now. Um, so that feels like it would be fine. So we can, you know, take this, shove it here. Um, here we go. Color buffer, normal buffer. Uh, actually, yeah, I think we will make these textures separately and then put them in the FBO. Let, let's do that because there's actually reasonable reasons for doing that. Um, make FBO. Um, what is it going to be? Post text. We're going to take this. Let star. Post texture is that. Um, the. One, two, this is going to be our normal texture and or normal buffer. And then this is the albedo text. So we're going to generate each of these. Boop, boop, boop. Um, norm text, albedo text. See what's going on in chat. Uh, <laughs> speed three, let's go. Debug zero. Absolutely, man. Um, Let's have a look. Um, so now we do need dimensions in this, so let's go and get those. The dims are going to be the um, viewport dimensions of the current viewport. Um, that's cool. Just shove all this down. Fuck you, pretty code. I'm make ugly ass code. Right. Okay. Um, what else do we need? We've got some setup shit to do down here. We need to set the texture parameters for each of these. Um, they're using 16-bit float. We're going to use 32-bit because there's just no reason for us to care in this example. Um, we're going to set the minimize, minimify, and magnify stuff. We can't. We can't do that when we're specifying the texture, can we? No. That's fine. I actually prefer it that way. Oh, yeah, they're setting the sampling parameters on the texture itself, and we don't do that. We always do it, we set them on the sampler. That's interesting. Hmm, okay. Uh, plus sampler, norm sampler, albedo sampler. Come on. Ah, fuck you. Okay, right. This is going to be sample. Plus text. Um, we're going to do it with... Minify filter as nearest. Um, magnify filter as nearest. We're going to drop things down into different lines again because we love the mess. Yep. Um, do we need a depth buffer in this? I think we do. So let's... Um, D with dimensions dims. Is there anything else we need to do? There's something I'm missing up here as well. 
Come on, let's have a look. We probably don't want... I think mipmaps are on by default, so let's turn all that shit off. Um, really? There we go. Um, mipmaps is nil. Let's do... Generate mipmaps to nil too. Um, just because I'm feeling sociable, let's knock that down a line. Um, let's do, what else do we need to think about? I don't think we need to specify anything else. We're not doing QMAPs, we're not doing rectangle textures, using mutable storage, not using buffer storage, not using, uh, we're not generating map maps. Don't have to care about the pixel format because we're not uploading anything, we're not doing any samples, we're not doing fixed sample locations, no. So we're fine. I think that's all right. Um, and from that, we've also got our samplers, and then we can make our gbuffer FBO. <sighs> Almost feels like we should make a little class to shove all this stuff in. Um, we do def class gbuffer. We have the FBO. We can have um, our veto sampler. Norm sampler and what was the other one? Oh no, yeah, it was position sampler, wasn't it? And it was uh, that one should have been there. In it of oh, if I can learn to type one day, um, it's a dream. Can we not but dream? Right. Let's go down here, and then we could say, hey, let's make an instance, come on, of gbuffer, uh, where the FBO is this. Then we don't need this gbuffer FBO thing. Um, We could actually just stick these down here, right? Let's just whoop, whoop. sampler, sampler, sampler. Let's go back here, pop those, put those as the arguments. Let's drop this up as well. Actually, no, they were fine there. They'll be happy there. Okay, do we, we also probably want to put the, well, we could put the textures in the gbuffer object, but we've also already can just grab them from the samplers, so maybe that isn't necessary. What else do we need to do? Okay, so this is a three component float, like three component vector. This is a three component vector. This is RGBA. What? Stay. Um, let's have a look at the time. 53, we're still alive. <laughs> Someone's referring to um People means asking what well, what are the Emacs commands are those? So again, there's the multiple lines one. There's something I'm doing here where I'm basically saying I'm selecting something and I'm like going highlight the next thing that matches that pattern. So you can see I'm doing this. So in this case I was going, hey, the next thing that looks like hyphen sampler. And now I've got multiple cursors. So whatever I do is replicated in multiple places. And sometimes that's just more comfortable way for me to do something. Sometimes I'll, again, just do it like a search replace. If we wanted sample to be sample, no, our sample, ba -ba 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 -ba. we could do that. Um, or we could record a little um, keyboard macro that we just act out what we want to do and hit, keep hitting F4 to reapply until we're done. Um, but yes, multiple cursors is the core of this one. And then I've just bound there is a function. Okay, so there's a couple of functions in play here. Um, and this one is MC, what is it? Mark next like this. That's the one I'm doing where, like where I select something and then I'm doing a key combo that's calling this. And I just do that a couple of times and then I carry on typing. Um, super useful. Took me a little while to get used to it. In fact, we did that on stream because Chimera 
was like going, why the fuck aren't you using multiple cursors? It's the right way to do things. It's definitely handy in some cases. Um, we cannot regex all of the things. So our last buffer here really shouldn't be a VEC3. It should be a, um, I mean, we can just say RGBA8, right? Or we can say that this is a um, uint 8 VEC4, you know, whichever. But I'm gonna refer to it as this because I'm very much interested in this being an albedo texture. So that's more useful to us. I'm a bit actually, see, I'm not sure about that either because the values that we're dealing with for albedo, these are high dynamic range, right? Because we've been doing that already. We have high dynamic range textures. What were we doing with them? Are we actually using proper HDR textures? Or are we just using textures where we're correcting the gamma as they come out? Um, yeah, I can't remember actually. I mean, we can go check. Let's, let's just, whoops, go down here. Get rid of that. Go back to render. Go to gamma. So we've got gamma correct and gamma encode for converting either way. So in our frag stage where we read our albedo, yeah, we we bend the, the gamma curve one way when we're reading from it, and then we um, go back the other way when we're doing our um, color correction and stuff at the end. So, like prep final color. If we go down here, we can see we're doing our tone mapping. And then we're generating our Luma. Is our Uncharted tone mapping got... Um, yes, this corrects the um, gamma at the same time. But we are not using um, the textures we're using. Let's have a look. Where's, here's our albedo texture. Let's just go and see. No, I, I'm, I'm like 100% sure that the textures we're using in this aren't uh, floating point textures. They're just textures where we've yeah corrected the gamma as we're coming in so we can work with in a linear color space. Um, I, I, the terminology is just not right coming out of my mouth, but oh well, we'll live with it for now. Okay, so operators, is that what we're doing? No, we're back with play with verts. Oh yeah, we're making our G buffer. We do need somewhere to stick this G-buffer though. So actually, let's def bar G-buffer nil. We've got that. It's probably a good idea for us to define a way to free that as well. Uh, everything's wrong. Okay, um, mipmaps is not a known keyword argument. Correct, it's mipmap. It's freaking out with this. Yes, this should be in a list, shouldn't it? No, it's fuzzy args. Okay, so it's each one needs to be, ah, yeah. Each one needs to be its own little. Okay, let's change this. Da, 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 da. Chris, sort your shit out. Okay, so that's fine. Um, let's stick this in its own function. Call it. I won't shove it in here. We'll do. I don't know. We'll do reset. Yeah, let's let's do reset G buffer. G buffers. Reset G buffer. We'll make a function down here. Reset. G buffer. No. Press all the buttons, but they're just not the ones I want. Cool. So now, for cool, reset G buffer. Hopefully, it won't crash. And then we can carry on with what we're doing. Yes. Good. We got a G buffer object, and it should be in G buffer. G buffer is not found. That's because you need an earmuff on the end. Then we can expect that. And we can see that we have an FBO, which is correctly set up. We have an albedo sampler, a norm sampler, and a position sampler, and inside each of those are the textures that we're interested in. 
Notice they're 388 by 788, which is this resolution right here. So we are pretty good. And um, I saw a mistake. Did you see the mistake? Look in our sampler. What does our wrap say? Repeat, repeat, repeat. And we know we don't want that. We want clamp to edge on all of those. So let's do a few things. So down where we're specifying the sampling. Oh, fuck. So easy to cock that up, though. Right. We can specify a wrap, and we can want to say clamp to edge. The reason is, otherwise, when we sample down the frag, like the texels and the edge of that texture, it's going to um, linearly interpolate them with the ones on the other side. We'll get garbage. We definitely don't want that. Anything else? Oh yeah, like now we've defined this G buffer, it would be really good to be able to free it. So let's um, do def method. What do we call our free functions in here? We'll just call them free. Okay, yeah, sure, free. Um, and it's gonna be obj, and then the object is gonna be a G buffer, if I can just remember where the G key is. And then we want to go with slots, FDO, position sampler, Edo sampler, norm sampler. Um, we're going to pass in the obj back. That guy can sit up here. You can spell it right. It's only three letters, but they're the three wrong letters. Um, How's this man? Just waking up. How you doing? Um, we're going to free the FBR. Um, but we need to free everything that's involved first. So to do that, we're going to go first, just take our position sample. We're going to free that, of course, so we can say free. Um, oh yeah, FBO, sorry, that's how I wanted to write that. But we also want to free the um, sampler texture. So that's this texture that sampler is pointing to, so position sampler. I'm going to do that three times. We're going to do it once for norm. And we're going to do once for albedo. I'm going to spin those around because I just prefer that order. Albedo sampler sampler. That's my favorite sampler. Um, that's good. So we free the textures. We free the samplers. Then we free the FBO. Cool. And now we should be able to go down here where we've got our research G buffer. And the first thing we'll do is when g buffer free g buffer. Let's just stick it in that line. Boop. And then we've just gone and added wrap clamp to edge. So now let's do reset g buffer. It didn't freak out, which is good. That means our free is all working. We can go in here, look at our samplers, and now we can see that they're clamped to edge in all the dimensions that we care about. It's good, we're minifying max five filters are nearest. Um, and nothing else is of interest to us at all. Okay, let's keep going. Um, we have our G buffer. I think that's right. Let's just look quick through. Min mag, setting up the attachments. No wrapping? I guess they don't worry about that. Maybe they set it up later when they're doing the, I don't know. Okay. We definitely don't want wrapping though. Um, okay, so now we're gonna want to, we're gonna wanna render our scene into our G buffer, which is just gonna mean we're gonna do with FBO bound, um, and we're going to get the FBO uh, from our G buffer. So we'd be like slot value G buffer FBO. And then we're going to do a bunch of rendering code. And that's going to be down in here somewhere. So rather than the scene FBO, we're going to be doing. Uh, 
Um, we're going to go populate G buffers, populate G buffer, and then um, we're going to we're going to do an SSBO pass. SS SSBO, SSAO pass, um, and then we're going to do a final render or something like this. Um, we're going to want to clear our FBO. That is legit. We want to do that. Actually, how do we want to do this? Yeah, let's just call it let FBO. Let's just put the slot value there. We could just do with slots though, can't we? With slots FBO from G buffer. Goodbye. With FBO, clear FBO. And then we're gonna do other stuff. What is that stuff? We're gonna to have to like this, we're gonna to have to loop through all the things. In fact, this is probably where this is the only place this is gonna happen because the other passes are gonna be using this information. So that can go away. Um, eh. Whatever. Um, for each of the things, we're gonna update it, we're gonna draw it. So instead of draw though, we actually wanna change this. We wanna have something a function that is going to be actually we'll call it draw it's fine like we're just gonna be renaming all the functions if we do that so let's this is gonna be the one that writes into everything all the data into our G buffers so we're gonna have to write those shaders though um, so let's go there now um, we're rendering a thing I mean most of them are um, Asset things, so let's start here. So this is the pipeline. It's got two stages, the vert stage and the frag stage. Um, it's using this common thing, so I'm guessing we're gonna copy a load of stuff or just destroy everything. Either or. Um, Let's just copy this and make a file called old render because it might be useful to look back on what we once had without jumping to another branch. And then we're just going to break shit in here. Because um, what we really want to do now is we want to pass along different values. We want, again, we need to return clip pos here, but then we actually want to return the... Um, Yeah, we want the view position and the view normal, which we don't even have yet. Um, and then we want the albedo. But we're not going to be able to get the albedo here, but we do want the UVs. So what does treat UVs do? Oh, it just flips the UVs because we needed that. Okay, fine. Um, so we actually want this. Let's just do that. Um, that means right now we don't need this stuff. We do need the clip position. We don't need the world normal. We need the view normal, which means we're going to do model to view on the normal. Um, that's actually all right. So we'll go with that. But that's going to affect both of these stages, which is fine. Um, do they both use the same frag stage? They do! So we just need to fix up this frag stage now because it is going to be getting something different. Um, we are going to be getting the view pass. What's the time? Oh, shit, we've overrun. Fuck, okay. Um, let me just write down these few things and then we are wrapping up. The view pass, the view normal. Um, what else? What were you? Tell me more. Um, and the UVs. That's all, that's what we get. And then, fix me. Okay, so we're gonna have to, like we can stage this just because I'm sure Medigam wants to play with it. So I will push. Yes, I am gonna do the push-ups. Um, we're gonna go up, let's say broken. 
end of first episode. Look at that, like fucking clockwork, guys. In the last little bit, we go really, really fast and break loads of stuff, and we have to end the stream with a broken project. That is tradition, and damn it, we're not going to do it every single time. So end of the first episode, um, mid refactor uh, for uh, G buffer. Whoop, whoop. Okay, so. Um, basically, folks, thank you very much for dropping by. Um, this was a very, yeah, very documentation reading heavy episode. Uh, we will be doing, of course, lots more actual coding uh, next week. We're going to go through and we're going to set up our, we're going to fill our G buffers, which shouldn't take too much work. And then we're going to go through and implement the SSAO uh, pass. Um, and so at the at the end of next episode, what I want is the R equivalent of do 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 motherfucker, where are you? Of the right tab, I want to get to this right. So we're about twenty minutes maximum away from this. Then we need to do this. We also need to upload these samples, but that's not going to be too bad. This is where we're getting to next week, and then we'll do this stuff the week after. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, hopefully see you next week. If any of the people that dropped in midstream for kind of PHP stuff enjoyed what they saw, please do come by and do ask questions. I'm happy to go into any of this lispy shit at any detail. Um, yes, I don't look like I have anything better to do, do I? So, cheers. Catch you next time.